much. That was quite long enough. Um, <clears throat> I have a simple question to ask today, though to explore why I want to ask it and what the implications of the question are will take us into some very complex material indeed. So let me ask the question and then spend some time glossing it before we start to imagine what's at stake in it. My question is this, is it possible to talk about the history of climate change, which is the remit of the Rachel Carson Center, is it possible to talk about the history of climate change without a concept of nature? Is any fair that I should situate myself first? I am by training, as you heard, an expert in the ancient world. I also work in 19th century culture, and I've published a good deal on the Middle East. My main academic interest in matters to do with the environment is through my work on civic infrastructure and social change, which I've been doing for some years, particularly with UNESCO. So I approach the question I've asked about nature from the point of view of an intellectual and cultural historian, not an expert on climate change. But there is sometimes a value in asking the question from outside the clique. Now, why do I ask the question at all? In part, it's because I've spent some time of late with the work and the person of Philippe Descola, the great French anthropologist and great friend of my former fellow board member, Bruno Latour. Descola's work, Beyond Nature and Culture, throws down a very serious gauntlet indeed to any casual rhetoric about nature. And I'll try and explain why in a minute. But I've also spent a good deal of time worrying about the idea of nature in antiquity. Of course, Lucretius's celebrated epic, De Rerum Natura, on the nature of things, the great exposition of the physical world from an Epicurean perspective, has again become hugely instrumental in modern thinking, part through the discovery of his pivotal role in early modern scientific and philosophical thinking, the very foundations indeed of natural philosophy, and partly as a thinker for modernity, whose materialism offers a fascinating intertext with contemporary theorizing on boundaries between the material and its other. But my expertise is in Greek, and it's in ancient Greece, according to most writers, that the nature as a category is invented for the West. And since Descola is one of those writers who think that nature was invented in the 5th century, I also want to see whether his thinking about the Western invention of nature holds up and what we can learn today from some ancient foundational ideas and some pretty profound ancient jokes as well. Now, why do I think nature matters so much? Well, it should be obvious to everybody here that nature is not a natural category. That is, it is an abstraction which takes shape within a discourse, and it's designed on the one hand to link various aspects of the physical world, trees and rivers and animals and so forth, into a system which we often call in its local formation an ecosystem, or in a more woolly way, the environment. There are many other ways of dividing up the world, and there are multiple different ways of constructing what the other of nature might be. But on the other hand, and this is what really interests me, nature is a term that slips between being a description of the physical world and being a normative term, especially in its adjectival form. Let me give you two brief examples of what I mean. One area of antiquity I work on is the history of sexuality. And in the history of sexuality, the idea of the natural plays a very particular role. Certain practices, or pathologies even, are declared to be unnatural by their critics. Right? The most familiar is what we would now call homosexuality, and particularly the sexual desire of males for males, which has regularly been stigmatized, especially in the past, and still today in some circles, as an unnatural vice. Now, it would be wholly bizarre to suggest that things that clearly exist in the world are not part of nature, if nature means no more than the system of things in the world. Unnatural here means something that should not be done according to an ideological predilection. A rhetoric that defends itself by an appeal to nature as the world should be. There's a shift between what is and what ought to be, which, as we know, is where the wild things of ideology live, rather than the cool progression of logic. 
Indeed, it's striking that the, despite the fact that so many negative, judgmental words have been reclaimed by denigrated groups as a political gesture, queer, nigger, so forth, unnatural has never been claimed back. I don't know any example where someone is proud to say, my sexuality is unnatural, however queer it might be. Right? Now, my second example is from Shakespeare, why not? Um, Sir Shakespeare, perhaps. When Hamlet's father's ghost appears to demand revenge for his murder, he's clear that all murder is foul, but what really upsets him that this murder is strange and unnatural, revenge his foul and most unnatural murder. Now here, the use of unnatural is in the superlative form, which implies a hierarchy of non-natural things that take place in the world. You can be natural, you can be a bit unnatural, or you can be most unnatural. Right? Now some things, it would seem, are more or less of nature. There's a sort of gradational ontology of belonging. Again, nature and the natural indicate a normative view of how the world should be. In this case, in terms of family relationships, the most cultural institution of all, which always arrogates nature to itself. Nature, that is, comes trailing clouds of ideological insistence. So nature is not an empirical description at two levels. It is, first of all, an abstraction from within an ideological discourse that is integral, as Descola would insist, with an ontology. Second, it's a normative category, which is very hard to contradict. Even when it's allowed that nature is red in tooth and claw, even if you take a straight reading of Hobbes to imagine that life is solitary, nasty, brutish and short until civilization arrives to make it better, even so, nature is the ground that is given. How things that are, that rapidly becomes how things should be. And it's this slippage towards the ought that makes nature a difficult category for the inevitably political subject of climate change, if at least the ideology replete in that category remains untested. We could sharpen the bite of the opening discussion by taking an example where the buried, buried normative life of nature is at work. As, as, as Greg said, until a few weeks ago, I ran a very large research centre in Cambridge, which funded, amongst other things, a series of fortnightly workshops on cutting-edge topics. The funds are highly competitive, and we evaluate projects very carefully, of course. We had funded a group working on endangered languages. It was quite popular, quite well attended. And when they came to apply to us for a continuation of funding, they were asked a very simple question. Why should we care if a language dies out? Why, if for a range of socio-political region, reasons, no one exists to speak a language or a dialect, why should we try and maintain it? You might have thought after two years' work that would be a pretty easy question for the group to answer, but they couldn't answer it at all. It became clear that as linguists they were interested in linguistic richness, but their basic beliefs were predicated on the theoretical or better the ideological assumption that homeostasis of nature was a good thing and must so be. What is must remain or well, something terrible has happened. Why should we care if there are no zebras or Swahili left? John Ruskin in the 19th century caused a huge foray when he suggested that instead of restoring old buildings, we should just let them gently rot into the ground, as buildings have what he provocatively called a natural lifespan. The furore was not just because of his proposed policy, but because it was a policy that forced people to face their ideological commitment, all too often uncontested, to continuity as a necessary good. Heritage was a category under construction and still a source of intense disagreement. So in antiquity, in North Africa, there was a plant called sylphium. Classicists will know this. It was wild, it was harvested for food and medical purposes. With the arrival of the Romans in particular, we Greeks don't like them, it was drastically over-harvested and has been extinct since the first century BCE. We have no sylphium. Should we care? Of course, we can lament not knowing what it looks and tasted like. Obviously, some people liked it quite a lot. Of course, we could fantasize about the medical opportunity cost. What could it have been made into as a drug? But the fundamental issue seems to me that it's become something that it feels right and proper that we should aim to maintain the status quo of natural things. Plenitude. And a plenitude that should remain a plenitude. I take that this is an example 
where a hidden normativity drives debate. But it would be odd, wouldn't it, I think, to argue for the desirability of the return of the forests that covered Europe until the Renaissance and beyond. The history of Europeans is a history of actively and even aggressively changing ecosystems, often drastically. A lot of what we value and use depends on such depredations. We call ourselves self-servingly homo sapiens, when the creature we are is a creature that builds and destroys. Homo idificans et perdens, that would be better, might be a more accurate description of our natural condition. Where we are in the current time, call it the Anthropocene, is an extreme and potentially catastrophically irreversible version of what has been a constant pattern of human interaction with materiality. We destroy things. So what interests me is how the hidden normativity of the category of nature affects our discussion of the history of climate change and our engagement with the natural world, as I'll continue to call it. And here is where we need Philippe Descoulard. His widely influential book, Beyond Nature and Culture, is deeply engaged with a long anthropological tradition and based on intense anthropological analysis of a range of societies across the world. But his overall thesis seems to me to pose a fascinating question for other fields too. He calls the book Beyond Nature and Culture because the object of his critique is the apparent inevitability of constructing the world through a polarity which takes nature to mean the sum of the biological and material world and culture to mean the variables of human society which is both separate from and imposes itself on that idea of nature. And the polarization of nature and culture, however long the history of such an opposition is, is undoubtedly a fundamental structuring principle of much thinking since the mid-19th century, and remains so in much of the discussion of the environment and human's place on it. Descola is certainly unafraid of big structural thinking. He suggests there are four dominant ways in which we can see the relationship between humans and the environment, four ways in which indigenous communities construct that relation. That there are four ways immediately signals that there is no natural or inevitable way to think nature. There are always going to be four ways at least. Our traditional Western way that I've already just been describing, he calls naturalism. And Descola is pretty keen on undermining it as a system, at least as the hierarchically privileged model. In naturalism, argues Descola, physicality is a constant. The stuff that bodies and things are made of. But what has life or spirit or soul differs. So a human will have a soul, a table won't. We may share materiality with rocks and jaguars, but we are quite different from them in terms that are not physical. Now, the second and the system, second system, the one he himself seems most sympathetic to from his work with the Achua, he calls animism. In animism, there's no opposition between nature and culture, but a continuity where the spirit and soul is continuous, but there are physical differences. So jaguars and humans and yams are all the same in their social setup and in their souls, but they just take different material form. It makes sense when an Achua says, my mother crossed the river and became a jaguar, or a jaguar drinks beer when it consumes what we foolishly call blood. Interiority is the same, physicalities are different, the reverse of naturalism. The third category is totemism, where interiorities and physicalities can both be shared. We are the bear group, and the bear shares characteristics with us. Another group is the elk group. They're different from us bears, but share physical and social characteristics with elks. And the fourth relation is analogy. Here, both interiorities and physicalities are different, but are related through analogy. The microcosm of the human group is analogous to the macrocosm of the world. Now, there are ways of challenging any such grand picture by searching for further interstitial categories, arguing for overlaps between models, or by seeking out problematic examples. And I'm sure you could do that. My utilization of Descola here doesn't depend on detailed agreement or disagreement with the model, which I actually have some problems with. What seems to me to be crucial 
is that Descola emphatically demands that the structure of our thinking about nature is socially specific and situated within a specific Western tradition. And it would be pretty difficult not to continue such an argument to a place he doesn't go. And note that modern science itself, as an Enlightenment project, is also firmly placed in such a Western tradition. And while Rainey Daston and Peter Garrison have brilliantly outlined the 19th century development of the category of objectivity, which is integral to so much modern scientific methodology, it's also the case that the subject position of the scientist, as the figure who approaches the objects of the world, is deeply embedded in modern institutions and ideology. We call it natural science because it looks at what we've learned to call nature. That is, the notion of science and the notion of nature are deeply and integrally intertwined in Western tradition. And much of the best work on the environment within the modern Western university is beholden to and takes up its position within precisely that tradition. To understand climate change, we are told, is a scientific project. Would anything change if we began to recognize that these constructed categories of science and nature are not natural, but an integral part of the very forces that are making the Anthropocene such a terrible reality. Does it matter that science and technology, which are required to provide a diagnosis and a cure, are actually a fundamental cause of the problem? We don't normally find the cure in the problem. But here we're being asked to. It might change the way in which we think about the teleology of the project and its sense of causation. And that might make a significant difference to how we organize the field of environmental humanities and climate change. Let me give a little example, one example of how thinking a little harder about the history of the cultural category of nature might help it, help us. And for this, I'm going to go back to home territory, gratefully, where I also think Descola is on rather shakier ground than usual. Descola, following the standard line, thinks we should chase our category of nature back to ancient Greece. And he's absolutely right that the Greek term phusis, from which we get our words physics and physicality, and which is usually translated as nature, occurs only once in Homer, where it refers to the nature of a specific plant, a weird plant called moly, and its specificity is its phusis. Right? There's no abstract idea of phusis. Nothing to link the so-called natural world into a world or to oppose it to an idea of culture, for all that Homer is happy to juxtapose monsters and men, uncultivated landscapes and civilised dwellings. It's in the Greek Enlightenment of the 5th century BCE that phusis first becomes a general term, where it is usually opposed to nomos, that is, to law or custom. It can apply to an individual human whose nature will lead him to act in a specific way, or to what is taken to be a fundamental nature of an institution or an object or event that explains what it is. It can be both natura naturans and natura naturata. That is, phusis is causal, and it represents less commonly the results of that inevitable action. But, first of all, there is still no general category corresponding to the later notion of nature as a general term for plants, animals, trees, and so forth as a whole. There's no notion, for example, of the laws of nature in the 5th century BC, since the word for law is nomos, which is most often the opposite of phusis. Right? It would make little sense in general, though of course I have found one example in Plato who always pushes things to the, to the limit, where to say the nomoi of phusis. It made no sense in Greek to say the laws of nature. It just doesn't make sense. Right? Because of this, there are no romantic fantasies of living in nature, right? or being true to nature in ancient Greece. That's just not an available thought pattern. So that comes from somewhere else. But... What I find fascinating is the way in which Greek literature has already worked to undermine what we now take to be one of the basic affordances of nature. In the second century CE novel, Daphnis and Chloe, which you may know from Ravel's music stimulated by it, the plot is simple enough, you'll be pleased to know. Two children, a boy and a girl, have been exposed at birth and they grow up in the deepest countryside in nature. They are so innocent that they do not even know the word love or desire, eros in Greek. The novel traces how they do fall in love, 
But they don't know what's happening. And gradually, through many a full start, they gain an erotic education that for Chloe is only completed with the last words of the novel. It's sexy, funny, it's all too knowing as a book, and it was disparaged by its Victorian critics for its revolting hypocritical sophistication, which is why I like it, of course. Most <laughs> importantly, for my present purposes, are the games it plays with its audience who cannot share the innocence of its protagonists. It teases us with some very salacious scenes where, for example, a grasshopper jumps down the front of Chloe's dress and Daphnis has to take it out, or where Chloe washes Daphnis all over and tests which part of his body are hard and soft in comparison with her own, or when they try to assuage their desire by following the advice of a shepherd and lying down naked together and after an hour of unmoving agony find things are even worse. Fussis is a presence in the novel. It's opposed to technair, to technology, to artifice of human achievement. And the novel's central question is, what is the natural state of desire? What is desire in nature? If you could get back to the countryside, could we find the truly natural? The novel, however, answers by mocking such a stupid question. The two lovers don't know how to do the most natural act of all. The act of sexual procreation without which there aren't any humans in nature. But they do know, absolutely naturally, to throw apples at each other, which is the most culturally charged act of erotic courtship in ancient Greece, the equivalent of giving your beloved a single red rose. So they can do the single red rose absolutely naturally, but they don't know how to have sex. It would seem that convention is the most natural thing there is. Or perhaps that nature is really conventional. The novel plays many games on this theme quite brilliantly. And as the normalness of homosexuality still gets discussed today, it's always for me such a joy to read the wonderful assertion in an ancient Greek text that sums up the problem. It says... Male lions don't desire male lions because lions don't do philosophy. <laughs> now, Daphnis and Clay reminds us through humor and provocation that the desire to see nature without human intervention is a fantasy. That isolation from other humans wouldn't produce a vision of the natural because we carry our conventions inside us. Conventions like our ideas of nature. That every time we imagine we could get back to nature as a criterion, we're in projecting the imaginary of culture. We're fantasizing about ourselves. And it's good for me to remember that from ancient Greece onwards, nature is always already a contested, socially useful, socially divided, embedded concept. Greece is not the childhood of the West. This offers something of a challenge to Descola's description of the origins of naturalism. But it, more importantly, it allows me now to restate my opening question with what I hope is a more developed framework of comprehension. Is it possible to talk about the history of climate change without a concept of nature? What are you committing yourself to every time you talk of nature as the aim? Is it possible to make the necessary case for intervention without committing ourselves to an unconsidered ideal or fantasy of the natural? Thank you.